time, it's really important to ask questions um, because then uh, I know what to explain. Um, I sometimes um, forget to explain something or uh, think something's obvious, but it's, it's just obvious because um, I've been working on it for 30 years. Uh, so, so it's, um, it's really good to ask questions. Okay, now, um, so let's start with questions. Are there any questions about the material at the moment? Do we have a plan for our first homework? Yeah, I, um, I've been thinking about homework and um, I thought I've got one problem in mind and I'll explain it to you in the lecture. Um, and I'll assign more homework this time for the moment. But um, we're just setting up the formalism and so I don't see a lot of homework problems. Um, I'll, I'll post them on the web page. Um, so let's see. So far we've done um, path integrals uh, in the standard way in which the, uh, the amplitude, the quantum mechanical amplitude, is an integral over paths and uh, they're weighted by phase factors which are e to the i and the classical action of the process divided by h bar. And we've set h bar to the 1, so we the h bar doesn't show up there, but we should always keep in mind that it's, uh, there's, a, there's an h bar there. So in other words, um, we're talking about amplitude for um, some Q of T. So that's the way we're we're thinking um, of it, and we worked that out, and um, for a single variable, and we worked it out for um, the case of um, uh, we, we we looked at the Arnold Bohm effect. Let, let me now um, consider a different um, object, namely um, something like this. And um, what we'll see is that this turns out to be an e to the minus something that people would write this way. And this is said to be the Euclidean action as opposed to the ordinary action. It's basically the energy. So I want to um, work out uh, this case. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> I'll take the chocolate if he doesn't want it. What? So the Euclidean action, you mean you said that it's stupid the jargon. You are? Uh, but you said that was equal to the energy, right? Uh -huh. That's equal to the energy? Though? Yeah, effectively. Yeah. So it doesn't have anything to do with it? All right, let me explain the jargon. In the simplest case of a single scalar field, we're just doing quantum mechanics at the moment. We'll go to field theory probably during this lecture. But S of Q is an integral phi dot squared minus grad phi squared minus m squared over 2 phi squared. This is e four x. This is sort of the standard action. I'm, I'm, I we'll get to this, but I'm just show, just from the point of view of lingo of jargon. S e would be an integral of a half phi dot squared plus a half 
squared phi squared plus I have m squared phi squared equal things. And so this is basically energy, this is action. But, but we'll get to this uh, uh, if it's puzzling. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I already got my chocolates. Yeah, so okay. One second one. Sorry. Oh, she hasn't, so let me. Thank you. Uh, this is more of just a clarification of your notation for um, the second term in your um, SEUQ. Yeah. Oh, sorry, the third term. Um, can you just. M squared, five squared. M squared, five squared, thank you. Yeah, but um, so I guess up to this point, like we've just been doing path integrals with um, just paths. Right. I'm, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay with just a single quantum variable Q with a corresponding conjugate P. The yeah. commutator QP is I H bar H bar over one. So it's so I'm going to stay with that at the beginning of the lecture. Yeah, but I was just curious. Um, so for that, um, you know, kind of energy action. Um, you know, path integral. Um, I mean, what would be, because normally we differentiate with respect to time. So we have a dt you know, integrating um, for each you know, classical path. And I mean, what would we differentiate with respect to along the, you know, the s sub e of the integral? You mean this thing here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beta, we're thinking of it as 1 over kt. Okay. It's sort of an inverse temperature. Okay, so I mean it's integrating basically with respect to temperature? Inverse okay. temperature. Okay, okay. Yeah, now I, I brought some chalk from my office, but I only have a couple of, I think I'm going to run into the department office because this chalk doesn't make much of an image on the board. And um, I don't, I see there isn't any chalk in here. Okay, class this place. Okay. <laughs> so the other group, there was like only one race here. That's like at least two. This is almost a degree. Sure, that's fine. Because I feel like, I mean, it's a different have to do it. Yeah, but you had a second time. Like, I feel like you should just go to someone else. I know, like when you're at home, it's lower chocolate. This time? Oh, yeah. yeah, but so that's one piece of chocolate for the price. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think it looks like it's more French deals. I think next time. Yeah, but I don't know if there's any other side. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.
let's call those E I. Okay. So now let beta go to infinity, and the only one that's the, the dominant one that survives is the is the state of the lowest energy. So that's one reason why this is an important operator. But it's also the basic operator of statistical mechanics. So quantum statistical mechanics, we want to know about this. That's the idea. Because I learned that quantum statistical mechanics. Yeah. Like quantum statistical mechanics. No idea. So that's how you make do that. Find out. Quantum statistical mechanics or field theory of finite temperatures. Okay. Anyway, let's let me let me let me go on a little bit. As I said, though, this this chalk is going to be in trouble. Um, so um, let's take it as a Hamiltonian again, just. A simple system, just one variable. Um, let's see, maybe I can. Okay, and then I'm going to say that e to the minus epsilon times e squared over 2m plus v of q, I'm going to write this approximately <coughs> if epsilon is really small as e to the minus epsilon p e squared. Thank you. It's all a bunch back here. Oh, good. Um, so I'm going to write it like this. And then I'm going to uh, use a complete set of uh, eigenstates of momentum. And then I'm going to say that. So notice the difference here is previously we had e to the minus i epsilon. This is just e to the minus epsilon. say it. Um, if you just Taylor series, yeah, you just Q. with the Taylor series. Yeah, and it just comes out as some linear amount of Qs, and then it just holds it back into its function. Right. Just like when you prove the exponential 
either the piece. Yeah, all or right. Maybe the Taylor series is best. In other words, you write this as some uh, one over n factorial v the nth derivative of v at zero. So that's some number q to the n on q prime. And so this is some one over n factorial v n of zero q prime to the n q prime. And so this is v of q prime of q prime. So that's 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 one way of thinking of it. Actually, um, the way I think of it, which is one reason why I sort of hesitated a while, the way I think of it is that these operators you can think of in terms of matrix mechanics as, as matrices. If it's a finite system, then it's an n by n matrix. And um, in general, you take the limit of an n by n matrix as n goes to infinity. But now you think of, well, what is a function of an n by n matrix? Well, you diagonalize the um, the matrix and, or, or you diagonalize the, you think of Q as a matrix, an n by n matrix, you diagonalize it and then you form the function V of Q. Anyway, there are various ways of thinking about it in terms of, if you think of it in terms of square matrices. Why don't you, send, I tell you what, why don't you talk with me after class and I'll send you a PDF that talks about this. Okay, any other questions? Uh, do you want a chocolate? You certainly earned one. Okay. Give to someone else. Okay, so, so what do we have here? What we have is an integral. Um, Uh, e to the minus epsilon v prime squared over 2m minus epsilon v of q prime and then these inner products give us uh, e to the i p prime um, q double prime minus q prime over square root of 2 pi and then a dp prime. So now um, <coughs> As we did in the case of um, of uh, the ordinary path integrals last time, I'm going to write q prime dot as q double prime minus q prime over epsilon. This is just sort of a notational change, and so then our amplitude is actually there are two factors of one over root 2 pi, so there's a 1 over 2 pi, so we have 1 over 2 pi, e to the minus v of q prime, integral e to the minus epsilon p prime squared over 2m, plus i epsilon p prime q dot prime p prime. Now we can do the p prime integration. It's one of these Gaussian integrals that we've done several times. And uh, what we get is m over 2 pi epsilon to the 1 half e to the minus epsilon times a half m q dot prime squared plus v of q prime. So you see this is a piece of energy times time, and uh, remember that q dot prime is q double prime minus q prime over epsilon, where this is the q double prime. Okay, now the next step is to link two of these together. Yeah. Uh, how are you getting rid of the epsilon that was attached to the exponential and made it be q prime? Sorry, say that again. In the second to last line that you wrote, how are you getting rid of the epsilon that was attached to the uh, e to the negative v q prime? Because it looks like there's a... 
He just looks like you, Tex. We have an epsilon here and an epsilon there. Right. Oh! That was a mistake. As I've said to you many times, when my left hand is up, I'm usually doing things correctly. When the left hand is down, I'm thinking. And then when I think, I make mistakes. So, good point. That's where this epsilon comes from. Any other questions? Put two of them together, and we have Q triple prime, e to the minus 2 epsilon h Q prime. And we can write this as then an integral Q triple prime, e to the minus epsilon h Q double prime, Q double prime, e to the minus epsilon h prime. And we know what these matrix elements are because we just figured one out. And so this has two of the square roots, m over 2 pi epsilon, e to the minus epsilon, a half q prime squared plus v of q double prime plus a half m you got prime. Oh, this should be a, this is a double prime. Right. All right, now, let's take one more step. I'm doing this pedagogical reasons. Let's go to a third step. So I'm going to I'm going to call this Q3 e to minus 3 epsilon h Q0. This isn't the right kind of chalk. Um, Funny. The cheap chalk works in one one room, and the expensive chalk works better in another room. All right. What if, what would this be? Just going from two to three, we see that this is just m over two pi epsilon to the three halves uh, integral minus infinity plus infinity q three e to the minus epsilon h. U2, U2, E to the minus epsilon H, Q1, Q1, E to the minus epsilon H, Q0, and now we're doing DQ1, DQ2. These are the two complete sets of intermediate states. And um, if we just carry out this maneuver, Uh, what do we get? Well, we get uh, M over pi epsilon to the three halves integral Let me see. I did the, uh, I skipped, I, I skipped a step. I must have had my left arm down. That's what's correct. Then we get this. Okay, so this is the, this is the three epsilon case. We've got three square roots. 
we have two intermediate integrations and we have all these energy pieces up there. All right, now, what I want to show you now is that I'm going to actually do this integral for you, and I think that, and I actually went to the trouble of late tech again. Um, and so let me, let me erase this board a little bit and then show you what what happens. I think this should give you more of a
integral e to the minus m over 2 epsilon. All right, now, there is a method to what I'm doing. It, it, it may seem as though I'm going on very long about something, but I, th I think this is worth seeing. So this is Q3 minus Q2 squared plus a half Q2 minus Q0 squared dQ2. So I'm doing essentially the rest of that integration. We've done the Q1 integration, now we're doing the Q2 integration. I see a frown. Um, is Sorry, it, that's my concentrating phase. That's your what? That's my concentrating phase. <laughs> okay. All right, so now we do the Q2 integration. And if we just rewrite it a little bit so that we can use our Gaussian formula, e to the minus m over 2 epsilon, 3 halves q2 squared minus 2, wait a minute, I'm sorry, minus 2 q3 plus q0 q2 plus q3 squared plus a half q0 squared all that dq2. All right, we once again use our Gaussian integral formula. Now we're setting r equal to 3m over 4 epsilon and c equal to m over 2 epsilon times 2q3 plus q0. And when we do that, what we find is that this integral is equal to m over, and I'm going to write 6 as 2 times 3 pi epsilon to the 1 half e to the minus m q3 minus q0 squared over 2 times 3 epsilon. And I maybe should have used up more space on the whiteboard to write that down. But I can repeat it for you. You see the time, notice the 3. 3 here. 3 here, 3 there. In fact, it would make a little more sense if I wrote it this way. 2 pi, 3 epsilon. So now we can leap to the case from 3 to n. What would it be? It would be qn, e to the minus n epsilon h, q0, is m over 2 pi, n epsilon to the one half e to the minus m q sub n minus q zero squared over two times n times epsilon. Now I'm going to just set n epsilon to the beta, and so this then is q n e to the minus beta h q0 is m over 2 pi beta to the 1 half e to the minus m, oh, I'm going to call this q beta, <coughs> minus q0 squared over so, 
what, I, what I'm showing you here is that you can actually do the path integral explicitly in this case. In other words, I, I approximated the path integral first as, as uh, three time slices, or rather two time slices, integrating over Q1 and Q2, and then I got this formula, and then I just said, well, clearly if you did it for n minus one time slices, you would get uh, this result. And so in a certain sense, I've actually explicitly done the path integral and, and gotten what is, uh, in fact, the correct answer. Um, so I, I, I hope that makes these path integrals look more real to you. Um, um, okay, so I was just wondering, and sorry, this is kind of getting back to some of the questions we had earlier. Um, but so I guess just if, you know, so if it's not, you know, if we're working with, you know, some position eigenstate and some position eigenstate and, um, you know, e to the, you know, i, or like, like a propagator. Basically, like that to me has a clear physical interpretation. You know, if we put a particle here, then you know the probability amplitude that'll end up here later is this. Um, and I guess for um, matrix elements of you know, e to the negative beta h, like I guess it makes sense to me if we have that sandwich between two, you know, like the, the diagonal elements of it, because those are just proportional to you know the probability that something would be in that energy. Stage. Um, but I guess just like as it is right there with e to the negative beta h sandwiched between two position eigenstates. Right. Um, I don't really where, understand. Where h here is p squared over 2n. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess I just don't really understand what, like I understand if, you know, we let beta tend towards infinity, then that will be just a projector on the ground state. But I don't really understand what the, like, physical meaning is of that for you know, non-infinite beta, basically. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know. I, let me say that one thing that gives me the creeps, to be perfectly honest, is whenever somebody asks me what the physical meaning of something is, I do get a creepy feeling in the sense that I mean, we're doing theoretical physics here, and the physical meaning, well, it's the whole, the hope is that you can do a calculation and then come up with a number that has some physical relevance. Um, this is an operator that I would think everybody thinks is worth computing because it's the standard operator of statistical mechanics, even minus beta h. Yeah, I mean, the, and uh, you know, just as e to the minus i uh, th is the time translation operator, this is an operator that tells you about uh, that that is of interest in statistical mechanics. But I guess just like e to the negative i th, like has the interpretation of if we start something in this state, then a time it's a time translation operator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I mean is there a corresponding you know, meaning to, like, if we can imagine that as a something translation. Oh, well, there. people, that's what people do, and I don't, I don't think that that's a terribly legitimate thing that they do. What people do is they say, oh, we're going to try and translate in imaginary time. So, for example, if you use, if you take this operator and replace T by, um, minus i beta, let t equal minus i beta, then what you get is minus beta h. And that's, that's what people um, say, but I, well, what you're obviously doing is you're computing e to the minus beta h, no matter what you say, for real beta. And that's, that's something of interest in itself. Okay. And I don't think it clarifies things to, to use this, uh, imaginary time 
lingo, but if you want to, you may. It's, it's okay. okay. I think this is simpler. It's, I mean, in, in physics, what, what you're doing is you're all, you're all computing matrix elements of operators. And what, what I'm showing here is that there are two, the two operators of great interest in quantum mechanics. One is the time translation operator. Another is the operator of statistical mechanics, or the um, it got Boltzmann operator, we can call it. And uh, matrix elements of the Boltzmann operator lead to a path integral that is uh, in, it says B in Euclidean space, but it's a path integral over energies, whereas uh, the time trans matrix elements of the time translation operator lead to a path integral uh, yeah, uh, weighted by the uh, E B I times the action. And this is effectively weighted by E to the minus the energy of the path times beta. And to get to get two, I mean one physical application is that this is in fact the whole basis of lattice gauge theory. The computations, in other words, if you try to do quantum chromodynamics, the, the theory is nonlinear, it's quantum, it's strongly coupled. And so the only progress that's been made has been to uh, approximate half integrals of, of this sort. <coughs> and the reason why it makes sense is that as you let beta get big, you're projecting out the vacuum, the ground state, and the ground state. And so the question is, what is what are quarks and gluons do in the ground state of the theory? Um, now, um, I, I did this explicit path integral for this particular case in which um, I was talking about even minus beta h. We could do the same thing. In fact, maybe I'll make that the homework problem. I'll, I'll, the, homework, the first homework problem then will be to repeat this, but for the case of the time translation operator. And so then what you'll see is the, the time translation operator um, for a free particle, uh, you can compute it with two time slices and then you, you see where the three is and you generalize to n time slices and then that is the correct answer because we know what the correct answer is. Yeah. So about epsilon, do we choose the value of epsilon such that beta over n, uh, no, beta over epsilon is integer, or it's the well, actual change of temperature? N is the number of of um, or n minus one is the number of time slices. Yeah, so I'm assuming that's a so so an beta integer. over epsilon has to be an integer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So is epsilon chosen that way? Or that well, we're taking the limit n goes to infinity anyway. Ah, uh, okay, so it wouldn't matter. Yeah, it's, I wouldn't. I wouldn't focus on that. I just wondered whether we choose temperature or epsilon. No. Isn't epsilon just your standard? Uh, Isn't epsilon just the usual infinity? Yeah, yeah, it's just a small number. Epsilon's a small number. When the euro first came out at one dollar seventeen, um, it then dropped to about eighty cents, and I used to say that the epsilon was the euro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, then George Bush ruined the American economy by launching an uh, invasion of Iraq and uh, overreacting to Al Qaeda, and uh, the euro went to one thirty. <laughs> All right, I'm going to say more about politics. Um, I grew up during the Vietnam War. That's when I served feelings about invading other countries. All right, so let's see. We. 
I want to sort of remember. Did did I, and I, I don't now remember, did I show you how to compute a particular case of the path integral for a free particle in real time? Did I do that calculation? All right, I'm looking through the notes. We'll see it in a moment here. I showed how to approximate path integrals. <clears throat> yeah, I did that. Okay, I did the free particle. So let, let us just let me just remind you of what the free particle answer was. Notice here is the case for the Boltzmann operator. If we instead talk about the time evolution operator, the analogous expression is Q final e to the i, that should be a minus sign, it's a typo there, e to the minus i h0 t q initial equals m over 2 pi i, I'm going to leave out the h bar, t to the 1 half e to the i m q f minus q i squared over 2 t. So you see the, the, the reason why I was certain that this was exactly the right answer is just by comparing it with this case in normal time, the translation on here. And so the homework problem then would be to and, and we got this, remember, by doing the trick. It's a finding trick of um, saying that uh, we had the classical <coughs> path, and then we, we compute the action of the classical. In other words, we took the study, e to the i s classical times a loop integral. And then we knew that the loop integral effectively was a, couldn't be a function of qf or qi but could only involve masses and so forth and, and the time, and then it had to be a delta function in the limit of small times, and um, we guessed that this was the answer, and then I said you could um, actually uh, evaluate this answer, and in fact you can do this integration, I was doing it by means of the path integral, you can do this integration much more simply by just inserting a complete set of p-states since this is just p squared over 2m, and it's a Gaussian integral, and then you get this answer. So this is the correct answer. And indeed, over here, you could also have gotten this answer just by inserting a complete set of q-states. So the reason I went through this thing was just to make the path integral real to you, to show that if you do it uh, with two time slices, you get something that has a 3 in it, and if you go replace 3 by n, you then, in fact, get this answer. So, in other words, that indicates that if you went through the enormous labor of doing 4, and then 5, and then 6, you would eventually, you would, the, the answer would always turn out to be m over 2 pi n epsilon e to the minus this for 3 times slices, 4 times slices, 5 times slices. Then go to so I wanted to just make these path integrals real. All right, we've got two questions. Yeah. Uh, so just to like generalize when this will be useful, because either way you're saying you can solve it exactly by just putting a resolution in the identity for yeah. p. But that's how we solve the uh, single time slice anyway. So I don't see how we're like, I mean, it seems like we're doing the same thing either way. Well, I'm, I'm just trying to make the make the path integrals real to right. you and show you that it's not just meaningless math. Well, could you give me an example then of like when it will be like a useful thing, like for like some set of Hamilton, yeah. some Hamiltonian yeah, or something? Yeah, yeah. Is that still a count? No, I mean, it, 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 yeah, all right, I'll, I'll I will um, do such a thing. Yeah, okay. But the the point is that in it's that 
one way of thinking about quantum mechanics and quantum field theory is to write everything in terms of pattern networks, especially quantum field theory. For example, if you look at Schrodinger's book, he starts out with path integrals and hardly mentions canonical quantization. And so you can, it, it's, it's also such a nice picture, you see, for, for a general theory, not just ordinary quantum mechanics. All right, so let me, Let's, let me see. Um, here's a topic that I, I can do now for you if you want, which is, oh, that's right, you have a question. Sorry, it's just, when you wrote the mth case, um, the mth case? So you wrote qm e to the minus m epsilon h, the mth case, or the nth case, sorry, the n, that's an n. This is beta. This either oh. one. Uh, just if you compare it to your integral over there, you got rid of your m2 or pi and beta. And so I'm confused. The, the, the yeah, the pi that. epsilons canceled, the m's canceled, and we just got that. So i1, you mean? Yeah, but shouldn't that also work out over here? Uh, over here, well, no. And the reason is we started out with uh, a three halves. And um, so we were left with a one half. The original expression um, had don't to get there had had a uh, for q three e to the minus three epsilon h q zero. The leading factor was m over 2 pi epsilon to the 3 halves. Mm -hmm. So in the integrations, 2 of the 1 halves cancel, 1 1 half is left. That's why we have this square root. So I really just don't see the, how you, when you do your general case and you apply it, how you get to that specific. Because you always end up, in your general case, you always have that m over pi beta to the one half, where you don't have that in the specific. Well, the, the leap I made was that for three, we had the square root of m over two pi, three epsilon minus m, q three minus q zero over two times three epsilon. I then replaced three by n. Mm -hmm. Now, admittedly, that's a leap that isn't, um, may not be, one that one would want to take if one's life depended upon it and one didn't know all this other mathematics. But since I know what the answer is, I took the lead. All right, now, to get, to get back to, uh, let me just sort of ask, the, what I could do now is the path integral for, path integral formula for a simple harmonic oscillator. So in other words, Q initial, Q final, e to the minus i t h, where um, h is p squared over 2m plus a half m omega squared q squared. If you want to see that, I'm happy to do it now, and it might be, a, it might be, let's say this is the right time to do it, or we can skip it. It's, it's in the notes, these notes which are online, but, um, so what's this, you, you, you want to see it? Okay. okay. All right, so this is the harmonic oscillator in real time. And I just wish I had more of this that writes well on these blackboards. Um,
So, so now we're talking about H as P squared over 2M plus a half M omega squared Q squared. And what we're doing then is Q double prime e to the minus i t h q prime, we expect this to be some integral e to the i s of q dq. Right. Now, what's the action? Well, s of q, of course, is an integral of a half m q dot squared of t um, minus a half m omega squared Q of t squared, uh, let us say dt prime, so I'll put a prime there, 0 to t, because it's a t. Now, um, what are we going to do? We're going to approximate this by the classical uh, solution. And the classical solution is the one that, one way of thinking about it is we take d by d epsilon of the action of Q plus epsilon H, and we take this derivative at epsilon equal to zero, and we set this equal to zero. And what we have then is the solution then is Q classical double dot is equal to minus omega squared Q classical. So that's just the harmonic oscillator approach. And then we know that since this is a quadratic expression, Q classical plus delta Q is going to be equal to S of Q classical plus S of delta Q. Now, why is that? Well, the first, the term that would be linear in delta Q is zero because this is a, because the classical action is stationary at the classical solution. Do you want me to make this more explicit? Maybe I should make it more explicit. So in other words, this S of Q classical, my left hand is down over here, so. What would this be? This would be this integral. In fact, let me make it, let me take advantage of what's already on the board. I'll write this as Q classical plus delta Q. So that will be Q classical It'll be this term, but then there'll be a term one half M Q classical dot um, actually 2 delta Q dot minus a half M omega squared Q classical delta Q all that dt. Now this term is 0 because Q classical is stationary. And then there's the term 1 half M delta Q dot squared minus a half M omega squared delta Q squared dt. So this one is that. This one is zero. And the reason it's zero is if we integrate by parts, what we get is minus m Q classical double dot uh, minus a half m omega squared Q classical, all that delta Q dt, but this is zero because, oops, there was an m here. m classical double dot is equal to minus omega squared q classical. Um, I'm missing a, a one, yeah, it's a factor of two that's screwed up. Um, oh, there's a two here. And I just, ah, I 
example with the book. Okay, so this term then is zero. And we can integrate by parts and drop the surface terms because delta Q is zero at time zero and zero at time T. So in other words, we're talking about since we, these, all these paths go from Q prime at time zero to Q double prime at time T. And so we have zero T, Q prime, Q double prime. So they go from here to there. Um, whatever is, this might be Q classical, and now delta Q, or Q classical plus delta Q maybe does something like this, but delta Q uh, just goes from delta Q of zero is equal to delta Q of T. Zero. So we can drop the surface terms. Okay, so this is our expression. And so describing the action of Bill Kim. So I didn't understand. Say again. All right, so So Q double prime, e to the minus I T H. Q prime then. Now remember that this thing is actually an exact, this is an approximation in general, but when the Lagrangian or the action is quadratic or the Hamiltonian is quadratic, this approximation is exact. And so we're computing the exact uh, path interval here. And so what we get is integral e to the i s of q classical plus i s of delta q. And remember, dq is equal to dq classical plus delta q. But we're not varying that, so this is d delta q. So this is d delta q. And so this is e to the i s of q classical integral e to the i s of delta q d delta q. And this is a loop integral. Okay. So this is only a function of time. So this is e to the i s of q classical some L of T. And there's another typo. Okay, now, um, what is S of Q classical? Well, you can compute it as M omega over 2 sine omega T. And it's Q prime squared plus Q double prime squared times cosine omega t minus 2 Q prime Q double prime. So that's actually what the classical action is. Now, of course, what I see here is that I didn't bother to say what um, this, this, what Q classical is, but Q classical is a solution of um, the harmonic oscillator equation, which is this equation, but it satisfies the boundary condition that uh, Q classical at time zero is Q prime, and Q classical at time t is Q double prime. And you have to solve for that, and then you compute what this is. Um, this also would make a reasonable homework problem. Um, I'll think about assigning it. I don't want to assign too many homework problems, but it's a, it's a reasonable
reasonable form of problem. Um, all right, the next step. So now we know what this thing is apart from the loop integral. And now the loop integral is, is, is not, it, it is non-trivial. And let me show you how to do this. It's actually, oh, it's 36 already. And it's going to get to other topics. Um, well, let's expand delta Q of T prime as a Fourier series. Sum n equals 1 infinity sum a sub n sine n pi t prime over t. Okay, so this is a Fourier series that clearly satisfies the boundary conditions, namely that it vanishes at time zero and vanishes at time t, and apart from that it's arbitrary. Notice something that we think of this delta q as we originally were thinking of it, of it as small, but in fact, we're integrating, the, we're going to be integrating over these coefficients from minus infinity to plus infinity. So these variations are not small. But this thing is an exact formula here, even when delta Q is huge, because the action is quadratic. All right, this is another possible homework problem, namely showing that S of delta Q, in fact, is equal to a sum, N equals 1 to infinity, MT divided by 4, A sub N squared times N squared pi squared over T squared minus omega squared. Okay, so what is this path integral? This path integral is e, the loop integral is e to the i s of delta q, d delta q. So this is e to the sum, this thing, mt over 4, a sub n squared, n pi over t squared minus omega squared product over n d a sub n. But these are fortunately Gaussian integrals. And I left out an i, because it's i times the action. OK, so we can do this Gaussian integral. And what we get, and what I've, what I've left out here is um, uh, an overall, there's an overall normalization factor that came from, well, let, let, let us say there's an overall normalization factor, but I'm going to leave that out for the moment. Um, and what we get is then a product, n equals 1, to infinity 4 i t over pi m n squared to the 1 half, 1 minus omega squared t squared to the pi squared n squared to the minus 1 half. So this is what happens when you do the Gaussian integrals. And this simplifies somewhat so that it's square root of omega t over sine omega t product n equals 1 to infinity 4i t over pi m n squared to the 1 half. Now, you will say, what is going on? You've got this infinite product and you get a sine. Well, 
there are certain famous infinite product formulas, and um, I'm using one of them. Um, infinite products are kind of mystical things, and um, it's probably a relationship between infinite products and pantheons, actually. Um, well, we see that they're related here, but um, uh, now there was a normalization factor coming from the uh, p integrations. There's always that normalization factor. In my notes here, I was calling it n, <coughs> and that normalization factor is absorbed. Let me just put it out here. And so there's an, there's an N there. And this is again from the, from the P integrations. And so what we, what we finally get, I'll write the final answer over, over here. What we finally get is Q double prime e to the minus i t h q prime is square root of m omega over 2 pi i h bar, I put in the h bar just because it might be nicer to do so. i m omega prime squared plus double prime squared cosine omega t minus 2 q prime q double prime over 2 h bar sine omega t. All right, so that's the final answer. Now, I, you may say this was pretty complicated. And I agree with you, this is pretty complicated. Um, and um, this n that I was using here, let me just say what this n is. This n is a, um, it's km over 2 pi i t to the power k over 2. And um, so effectively, that's k this, yeah, this thing is a limit of k, and this may be k minus 1. So we're taking the limit as k goes to infinity. Yeah, there was a question. Yes, sir, you just answered it. Okay. All right, so so this stuff is, as I said, this, this is online. Um, together with a few typos, um, but it's, it's, it's an example of a particular application of path integrals. What, and you may say, gee, this is quite complicated, and I'd agree with you it's complicated, but um, still it works, and what we what people do in reality with path integrals is, is typically actually simpler. That is to say, the Feynman diagrams of quantum field theory actually are involve mathematics that's actually simpler than the mathematics that I went through here. Um, so, so don't don't feel. Don't let this particular problem off of you. Well, we're at the end of the hour. I was going to get on to some other topics, but um, I think what I'll do next is make a transition from. We were talking about one variable, one q and one p, and occasionally I generalized it to three, a particle in three-dimensional space. Um, the next step is to consider a general quantum mechanical system of n q's and n p's.
to write the path integral in that form, and it's we just extrapolate what we've already done, and it's clear what it would be. And so then, then the question is um, the transition to field theory, and that transition is one in which you say you have a QK of T and you associate with each point of space an index k. And so this thing is actually q of t and x, where x is a space variable. So now you've got infinitely many variables. So you go from a finite system, finitely many q's, to infinitely many q's. So maybe I should put an arrow here. The infinitely many q's. And then when, if you have a function of space-time, that's called a field. A field is just a function of space-time. <coughs> and so what we've done then translates directly into field theory. And so the amplitude field theory will be a path integral over all the fields weighted by e to the i, the action, the classical action of that field process, that field in space-time. Or if you're doing the Boltzmann thing, then it's the rule over all fields weighted by e minus energy of the field. Energy times time of the field. Okay, so I guess we can is there a question? Or I guess we just